I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe. for a word of prayer. Lord, uh, that is our prayer this morning, that uh, we would be a living sanctuary for you, that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, through the truth of your word, washing our minds, Lord, would meet with us and work through us and transform us into the people of God that you would have us to be. Lord, you are on the throne. Let us never forget that the throne um, is where your presence is and your power and that you are sovereign over all the events of this world, that you sit, Lord, in power, in glory, and we trust you. We trust you with our lives. We trust you with the course of uh, this body of Christ. We trust you with our nation and Everything it's going through right now, Lord, we trust you. You're a good God. And your word says that everything that comes into our life, that you can find a way to redeem it by working it out for the best in our lives. So, Lord, we trust you. We love you. We submit to you. We ask that you would work through us and speak to us, Lord. And we pray this morning. And we have many requests to bring to you. Um, Lord, we think about those um, who are awaiting test results. We pray that you would just be with them in this time of waiting. 
We commit them to you and we pray for uh, strength and peace. Uh, Lord, we think of Antoinette's sister, Connie. Uh, we pray for her and her liver issues that you would heal her physically and touch her body spiritually. Um, we thank you for Jill's sister that didn't require surgery. And we pray that you'll continue to touch her and, and, and minister to her, Lord. Um, we pray for our Calvary students' upcoming event, that you'll bless that, and that that will be a powerful time of building community and growing in you. And we love you, Lord. We thank you so much for uh, this season that we're in, Lord, with Thanksgiving coming up on Thursday. And I thank you, God, that we have someone to thank. <laughs> I thank you that we can just come to you and everything that we have has come from your hand. So we thank you. And as we, as we move on into Advent next Sunday, Lord, and we start this tremendous time of preparation for the birth of your son. Oh, Father, it's such a blessed season. And may we pause in all the crazy Black Friday, Cyber Monday sales and stuff and curbside pickup and order online. And may in all that cacophony, may we come back to the real reason for this season. We start with Thanksgiving, remembering to thank the God who created us and who gave us everything we have. And we move forward with, in a spirit of Thanksgiving to the incarnation where God put on human flesh to come and die in our place. So, so Lord, we just are so grateful for this season. You know, it's rainy and it's a little cooler than usual um, or than we, maybe we'd like, but we praise you for a time to just give thanks for, to, for all you've done for us, Lord. And, and Father, we also just want to continue to bring before you our community. Um, Lord, many people in our community and in our nation, Lord, are struggling with anxiety uh, about the future about the future of where our government goes, where things go with COVID, where things go with the great reset. And Lord, I, we just take a step back and say, we trust you and you've got it under control. And so we leave it at your feet and we're not gonna worry about these things. We're just gonna be faithful to proclaim your goodness and your God strength and your power and how wonderful you are, Lord. And we pray for our missionaries as they are abroad and many of them are also dealing with COVID restrictions and still trying to minister. We just pray for, for that. And um, we also thank you for test results that have come back negative. And we thank you that Crystal's cancer free and we just pray that uh, you give her continued health and strength, Lord. Pray, I pray for the school that meets here through the week, Lord. They've gone to four days, which is a lot for the teachers. Um, but Lord, the kids are just so awesome. And I thank you for the privilege that we have as a body to serve our community in this way. And Lord, we know we have new students coming in in the next couple of weeks. We pray for a, just a positive integration. We pray as these kids' minds grow and develop, uh, that their character and their spiritual life will be developed to walk close to you. And we ask all this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Um, let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read the scripture and then I'll give you a few announcements. And the kids will head out with Miss Robin and uh, we will go through Romans 6. All right, so starting with verse 1, I'm reading out of NASB. And uh, you can follow along on the screen or follow along in your own Bible. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it? Or do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ and have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God the Father, so we two might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united in him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, 
so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let's uh, go through a few announcements. Just want to share a few things with you. Um, and then uh, and then we'll do that. So so kids um, kind of peak, peak pre-kindergarten to fifth grade. We'll head out with Miss Robin after the announcements. And if you're sixth grade or above, you meet Wednesday night back in the in the K house, although you've been meet, you met here last week because it's a little warmer and um, and you have a, a time of teaching and learning. All right, so how you get our bulletin and how you get our announcements? A couple ways. CalvarySouthDayton.com, and most of you have a smartphone, so you just Google CalvarySouthDayton.com, or you can go to our Facebook page, which I hate to send you there, but you can go to our Facebook page, and that way Mark Zuckerberg can buy another white beater and uh, give him more money. And so you go there to CalvarySouthDayton.com as well. All right? So um, let's look at our announcements for this morning. Uh, a couple things I want to share with you. Uh, this week, obviously, Thanksgiving's Thursday, so pro- we, we won't have a Wednesday night service, which we usually have, but we won't have that this Wednesday. And, and uh, then next Sunday, we'll be here at 10.30 in the morning, and we start Advent. So we'll have a wreath, and we will light candles, and we'll do readings as an anticipatory process to remember the birth of Christ, all right? Christmas season is hard because there's a lot of things pushing on you, to draw you away from Christ. So it's really important to, um, to have that time to f- refocus on what the season is all about. All right, so the Christmas party is, uh, the pots are gonna host a Christmas party on December 5th. If you have any questions, Jim and Stephanie are here. So that's, um, just, just so you know, that's for the students. So any students, it's gonna be a great time. So talk to Jim and Stephanie, they're gonna, they're just, they're just a great couple, and we're so thankful they're willing to host the kids. So um, they did it last year, and it was just a good time. So um, We have some COVID updates in the, in the online bulletin as well. We'd like you to read through. Um, just if you have symptoms, we ask you to watch online or do drive-in church. We have several cars that are outside for drive-in church. We have uh, people that are really faithful that watch online every Sunday. We thank you for doing that, and um, that's a very real encouragement. Um, so we just want to remind you that if you have any pastoral care concerns, there's a number in the bu- online bulletin. It's 937-618-3030. That's where we'll take your prayer requests. And then those will get integrated into the online bulletin. And this morning, the requests that I even prayed through are all in the bulletin. So then when you go to have your prayer time through the week, if you have that in front of you, you can pray for the needs of the church body. All right. Why do we pray? Why do we pray? Have you ever thought about that? Why do we pray? It's funny because the disciples saw Jesus pray and they would have been in prayers, okay? Like they were Jews, so they prayed. And they watched Jesus pray and they went, you know, there's something about his prayers that are different. And they asked him, they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Because we see that your prayer life is so powerful. And so why do we pray? We pray partly to realign ourselves with who God is, right? Because the Lord's Prayer starts out as a pattern, our Father who art in heaven. Holy, hallowed be your name. It starts with God. It doesn't start with, hey, God, it's me again, and I have so much I need you to do. Okay? If anything, it starts by centering us on him. Then, after we ask for forgiveness for how we've wronged him, we go through a few other things, we get to our time of request, right? And why do we ask him for things? So as he takes care of our needs, we see his hand in our lives. Because our God is not a distant God who is disconnected, who's not part of your life. Our God actually knows about your life and cares about your life and intervenes in your life. I had a situation this week. I saw an injustice. I was praying about it. The next day, God sent the answer. The person who's being treated unjustly has a chance 
to move out of that situation really quickly. So what did I do when I saw that answer? I went, wow, wow, thank you, Lord, right? Because he did it. I didn't scheme. I didn't call the hotline, you know, report that person. I just prayed about it. And it's not like, look at me, but it's how God works. He's awesome. Okay, so um, if you're... Uh, if you self-identify as somebody pre-K to grade five or you're that age, you can go with Ms. Robin, okay? So we don't want to discriminate, just self-identify. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a few adults stand up. All right, so we're going we're gonna to be in uh, Romans 6 as they, as they leave. I thought, um, uh, I thought it'd be important that we kind of begin it with a little reminder of where we've been. So, so in the book of Romans... Paul has been laying this argument out. He starts with the gospel in the first 16 verses. And you're going to know this by the time we get through ch chapter 16. All right? First 16, 17 verses in chapter 1. Then he talks about all have sinned. He's, in chapter 1, he lays out, you know, people who've sinned, who have depraved minds. Chapter 2 and 3, he deals with religious people. Gentiles who do the right thing, even though they don't have the law. Jews who try to follow the law. And he comes up, culminates in 323 and says, guess what? All people have sinned. Everyone. All right? Two ways to get to peace with God, get to heaven. Two ways. One, live an absolutely perfect life. And uh, when you do, you can get to heaven and tell Jesus, to, you know, he can slide off the throne. That you, It's your turn now. Or you can get there like everybody else, and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ, all right? So he says, all have sinned. And then he gets down into chapter 4. He says, Abraham, Abraham, the father of the faithful, way before the law, put his faith and trust in God, and God credited it to him as righteousness. And then he kind of develops that thought in chapter 4. And then in chapter 5, he talks about our new state of being in grace, right? That we can walk with the Lord. And it's just a beautiful beautiful passage that, you know, God demonstrated his own, own love for us in, in verse 8, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, beautiful truth. Chapter 6, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul starts to ask, or starts to, pardon me, answer the very logical question that's going to come. Here's the question. So you believe that your relationship with God is based on his grace and based on the faith that you put in in like you have put your faith and trust in, in the Lord and his grace and now you've been forgiven and now you live by grace. And so when you sin, he forgives you. That is right. Well, at the end of chapter five, he talks about the fact that where there was more sin, there was more grace, right? We think of, of Martha um, uh, and Mary and Martha and how they, you know, they kind of saw life differently. One thought, I'm gonna sit at Jesus' feet and learn and the other thought, I'm going to do all this, you know, cleaning and how God said, you know, the important thing is it's good to have a clean house, but to, to really be at my feet. And then that is, is illustrated down the line when he's about to be crucified. When Mary Magdalene, who was delivered from many demons, although she wasn't a prostitute, that, that's not true. That's, that's a, a false teaching that's come to the church. She breaks a vial of oil and pours it over his feet, illustrating the fact that Mary sitting at the feet where you belong and giving what was basically a year's income to anoint Jesus. Remember? And, 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 and he said, what of her? Because she has been forgiven so much, she loves so much, right? If you think I'm really a great person, but I'm really glad that I'm going to heaven, so I put my faith in Christ... You will not value the gift of his grace as much as the one that says, I am a horrible sinner that deserves hell. That person will value the gift of God's grace. And so the natural question is going to be, the natural argument is going to be, so you guys believe you can live any way you want and you're okay because it's all by grace. And that's what chapter six is going to address. Let's pray before we get into it. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the, the, the truth that's in it. It is truth. It doesn't just contain the truth. It is truth. And we come to you this morning with it open on our lap or on our phone or iPad, wherever we're looking at it. We want to ask your Holy Spirit to speak to us 
through these words. And we ask that you would change us as we meditate on them. In Jesus' name, amen. So several years ago, around Christmas time, uh, Jen and I were looking for a gift for my mother. And she lives in North Carolina. And, you know, kind of this area from where we are down to northern Georgia, there's the Appalachian Mountains. And there's kind of the culture, Appalachian culture. And there was this book that was written by a man named J.D. Vance called Hillbilly Elegy. And it's basically looking at this culture coming out of uh, the hills of Kentucky, which many of them have relocated to southwestern Ohio after World War II for work. So in and around this area are people that uh, have this background. And unbeknownst to us, because we only read some reviews, I didn't realize that the book actually deals with this area, okay? The guy lived in Miamisburg for a while, and he mentions it in the book. It's kind of interesting. And one of the things that fascinates me about the book, and, and I'm going to tell you, anybody who is going to do any kind of ministry in this area or wants to understand the area should read the book. I will tell you on the front side, the language is horrible, okay? I hate the language in it. And some of the things that are mentioned are equally horrible, okay? So I don't know how to edit that out, but that is in the book. And it's, 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 I mean, I was reading it yesterday going, oh my gosh. Anyway, but it's good to know the people you live in and around, all right? I'll say that. And one of the fascinating things about this book is his grandmother, who, by the way, through the book swears like a sailor. I mean, honestly, it's bad. She would watch TV or she'd often sit and read the Bible. You know, probably the King James, you know. 1611. I'm sure that's what she read. And, and he said, he said, he started to talk about their Christianity, which I found very fascinating. He said, we self-identify as Christian. That's who we are. We're Christian. He said, we don't go to church. We don't really know that much about the faith. And he said, a lot of times the faith is um, kind of, we know this sense of that people who are really into the Christian faith are a little odd, like snake handlers. And, and what this young man learned in this house with his mother that was riddled with drug abuse and, and many, many different men is he learned this type of Christianity that was a complete abuse of Christianity. It wasn't biblical Christianity. And one of the hard things we have about where we live is trying to communicate the actual truth of the scriptures apart from what people have learned from their grandmother who sits with a gun on her lap, swears like a sailor, has a horrible mouth, and has the Bible on her lap. That's completely incongruous, okay? But we can't understand that. And so the problem is we get to this passage and we say, okay, so like how I live morally, does that really matter? Because I've been forgiven and actually, some people have taken this. There's a German theologian, and then there was this man named Rasputin. You may have heard of him. He came into the Romanov dynasty right before the, the Great Revolution. He, he's actually probably part of the reason why Russia fell, because he was so immoral. But he was a mystic, and he was a, a, some kind of believer in faith and a healer. And their Russian Orthodox faith, the Rasputins, was a little bit twisted as well and the, the peasants couldn't handle anymore. Um, that's part, part of the revolution. But he believed that the more he sinned, the more grace he received, and therefore he sinned a lot because then he had more grace. God likes me more because I've been forgiven more. That's the false teaching, okay? And that's the problem is, is we get to this point in the passage and we have to say, what's the answer to living in antinomianism. There's no law, so do whatever you want. And so he wants to drill down on our position, all right? So the question in this morning's sermon is, how do I live under grace? How do I do that? Well, the first thing in verse 1 he says is, what shall we say then? And he asks this question several times through Romans. Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Now that means continue does not mean that you sin once in a while. I mean, 
We all do, okay? If you don't sin, you need to drive more. It will lead you to sin, okay? Um, it's always odd because it's like everyone else is a maniac and I'm like the only good driver on the road. I think everybody thinks that. But, but he's saying here, are we continuing sin? Now that, that word in the Greek means, are we to abide or persist in sin? All right, this thing, hey, I mean, somebody the other day um, was talking to me and they said, I know this, and they're telling me about their boss at work. And they said he yells at everybody, although he's a Christian, he yells at people and demeans them. And I said, have you ever asked him about it? He said, I did. And his response was, are you ready for this? I'm only human. <laughs> I was like, what kind of response is that? Okay. Like, that's just part of my personality. Some people talk respectfully to others. Some people just yell and berate people. Okay. We don't have that as a part of our life. If we live in this, we have to ask ourselves, has the grace we've received saved us? If that grace doesn't change you, has it really saved you? That's the question. Because we should be being transformed in the image of Christ. And so he says here, how to live under grace is we need to know our position. And by knowing that, we start with our pattern our pattern should not be continuing to abide and persist in the life of sin. And how do we know that? Look at verse two. Uh, so, so the grace may increase is the question. May it never be or God forbid it. How shall we who died to sin live in it? Remember Jesus when he was tempted by the devil in Matthew chapter four, he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of of God. How are we to live? We're to live in light and through the prism of the scriptures. And it says in Ephesians 2, chap chapter 2, verse 1, that when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, okay? People are either spiritually dead or spiritually alive. And the difference is we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So if I'm spiritual, if I claim to be spiritually alive and yet I live like I want to, and just engage in any sin I want to, well, you have to ask yourself, why am I not being transformed? So in this, we know the pattern here is an ongoing pattern of sin. He says, may we not do that because we're supposed to be dead to sin. Now he takes that and he, next thing he says is, let's look at your position. What is your position? Or do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus and have been baptized into his death? So how do we baptize? We immerse, because the Greek word means to immerse. And when we do, the person does what? They go down into the water, right? And then we do always lift them up, by the way. We don't keep them under the water. And then they come up out of the water. And what's that symbol? Symbolize, they have died to their old self. They're were dead in their trespass and sin, and then they're raised to new life. That's why that pattern of immersion is how we do it. And that's the symbolism of it. It doesn't mean that everybody's had to have been water baptized in that manner to be a Christian. What it means is that water baptism is a symbol of when you come to faith, you're dead to your old self, and you've been raised again to new life, okay? So any pattern of behavior you've had for your whole life, you need to ask yourself, I need to have the Lord work on this because I've, I've died to sin. My position is that I'm alive. And, and he says, to make it more clear in verse four, he says, therefore, we have been buried with Christ or him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead, to the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. And that word newness means eternal life. So what we are saying here is we've been raised, we have died with Christ. The old man, the old woman died. That's our position. That's the Adam. Remember we talked about Adam last week and how Jesus is the new Adam? That person is dead. 
right? So somebody looks at you and says, you know, in your past, you know, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this, and that may all be true. But you say that person died when Christ died. And the person that lives now is a new person, right? I am crucified with Christ. It says that in Galatians 2.20. That when Christ died on the cross, our old Adam died with him. And when he was raised to new life, our newness of life was brought forth from the dead. Eternal life is not something that we get when we die. It's something you have now. Now, your bodies are not fit for eternity. Okay? We don't have eternal bodies. So the Bible says we have to get a new body, all right, so we can live in eternity. When they landed on the moon, they had to wear what? Space suits. Why? Because our human bodies aren't able to live on the surface of the moon. The fact that we can live on the surface of the earth is pretty fascinating if you think about it. Because some people live in very, very cold climates and their bodies adapt. And some live in very, very warm climates and their bodies adapt. The question is, what happens in eternity? Well, we need a new body. So the initial death and resurrection that we have in, the, in baptism is a symbol of this newness of life. And we have to know that we live in that. And we have to think about that newness of life. And that's our pattern. That's how we are to live as new creations. Uh, a man named Peter Malkin wrote a book called Eichmann in My Hands, and some of you may have heard of Adolf Eichmann. He's the other Adolf of Nazi Germany. He's the one who made sure everybody got on trains and got shipped to the many camps that they had set up. Um, and he lived in, until 1962, Eichmann did. He got, he got caught in 1960 in Buenos Aires, and uh, Peter Malkin writes his book, of his journey and how they captured Adolf Eichmann. And one thing he says in the book, which is fascinating, and it's interesting because um, there's also a whole spiritual element that's woven into the book. But one thing that's fascinating is, is how they captured him was this man, like he ran the trains, had a schedule that never changed. The bus would pull up at 725, he would get off, he would walk up the hill into his little house that they had every day the same way. And they watched and they watched and they watched for how he lived. It was his pattern. It was very easy to follow that pattern and to know that pattern. And that's actually how they captured him. He got off the bus and on his way to his house, he, the, the gentleman, Peter Malkin, said something in, to him in Spanish and then wrestled him to the ground and they threw him in a car and drove him off. So um, he wore gloves because he didn't want to touch him. Because this man who he caught orchestrated the death of his sister and his, his, uh, his nephew that he loved so much. But the point is, is that was his pattern. In the same way, we need to have a pattern. Daniel had a pattern, remember? He'd open those windows and he'd pray toward Jerusalem, which is what Solomon said when he dedicated the temple, and he'd do it three times a day. And so when Darius passed the decree that you only pray to me, the people who hated Daniel... There was fraud going on back then in the political realm. It is hard to imagine. Yeah, people wanted to take him down politically because Daniel was their boss. And so what happened was they waited for him to pray. And Daniel, following his pattern, the Bible says in Daniel, opened the windows and went to pray toward Jerusalem. And that's when he got arrested and got put in the lines. And he's probably 80 years old. That was his pattern. Okay, We need to make sure that our newness of life, that we've developed these patterns. And they actually say that we have, we lay down tracks in our mind, okay? The Bible talks about a new mind, renewing our minds. When you get into new, fresh patterns, the Bible talks about how we will live differently. It doesn't get into the medical end of it, but many people have written books on having our mind renewed by laying down new patterns, and in doing so, those patterns become part of who we are. And as people, we should have patterns of walking with the Lord, okay? We may not have the discipline of, of some people. We may live a little more free form. But, you know, Daniel, three times a day, he prayed. 
You know, nothing negative is said of Daniel in the, in the Bible. That's rare. <laughs> okay. Abraham, the father of the faithful, there's lots of bad stuff said about him. Okay. That guy had some bad stuff going on. And I could go into detail about other ones, you know. Everybody, even the Apostle Paul, everybody fails. Except for Christ, uh, Joseph, Daniel, that's about all. But he had patterns that he spent time in prayer. He had patterns that he spent time with the Lord, okay? And so it says here that our, our pattern and our, our position is that we're dead, and now we need to, be, and, and we need to live for the Lord. And then it says here, it says in verse 5, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Okay, I've heard a lot about the crucified life. People have written books about the crucified life. I've never read one book about the resurrected life. So if anybody's an author here and they want to write a book, you know, you may want to write on the resurrected life to know that we live in the newness of life. That we do not fear death okay you can only have 10 people for thanksgiving we've got a we've got to flatten the curve you know it's taken us 300 days i thought it was 15 but maybe 300 they were they it's like government budgets too you know 15 days 300 whatever you know we've got to flatten the curve you know what why are they concerned they're concerned about what mortality that people would die right are you if you're afraid to die you need to recalibrate your thinking because death is just a portal to be physically in the presence of the Lord. That's all it is. It's just going into another dimension with the Lord. It's incredible. So it says here that we, sh it says, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing in verse six that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has, has died is freed from sin. So actually it says here, it talks about the power you have over sin. You are no longer a slave to sin. Okay. Now you can choose to sin. That's a choice but you're no longer a slave to sin. And what do we mean by that? Now, it's fairly easy to illustrate when you look at, let's say somebody who's like got a drug addiction and they're doing something that they know is going to kill them and they know is ruining their lives and they can't stop it. And that's actually one of the threads that runs through the book Hillbilly Elegy, which has been made into a movie which I don't even know if you should see the movie. I don't know. It's, 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 it's a rough book. But his mother got into drug addiction, starting with prescription medication, and then she'd get, you know, and in, in, go into prison for a few days, or she'd come out, or go into an institution. She'd always come back to JD, and she'd say, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's the last time I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do it anymore. And then three weeks later, she'd disappear back on the drugs. And if you talk to anybody who's been in any position to deal with any person who has some kind of chemical addiction, they always say, they always know it's wrong. They always say they're not going to do it again. They always say they're sorry. And they always do what? They go back and do it. If you want to stop people from doing that, you know how you do it? They need to come to Jesus Christ. That's actually the answer. The answer is that we are no longer a slave to sin. Okay, when sin comes knocking at your door, you have the power through the Holy Spirit to say, no, no, I'm not going to do it. Now, you may say yes, but you're no longer a slave to it. You no longer can say that I, 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 I can't control myself. I, I, I have to do this. I'm not. No, you're actually just choosing to do it. Let's just be intellectually honest. All right. When I say something I know I shouldn't say or think something I know I shouldn't think, that's choice. Straight up choice. And we need to recalibrate our thinking. We're not a victim of our own sin. We actually choose to do it. And that's why it says, John, who at the end of his life, he writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the apostle. And the Holy Spirit says, you know, in chapter 1, if you say you have no sin, you make God to be a liar and the truth is not in you. 
That's pretty strong words. So we're all sinners, okay? Everybody does and says stuff they wish they didn't. The question is, how much do we want to give in to that old man? Right? And so he says here, he says, if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when you sin, you have an advocate and you, are, you can be cleansed. Correct. But you're no longer a slave to it where you like, I'll do whatever I want. You don't have to be a slave anymore. You can be free to live for God. And that's the difference. That's not legalism. That's not here are the rules, do the rules. That's you have the ability in the power of the Holy Spirit to say no to sin. People who are not believers in Christ do not have that ability. They don't, which is why they sin. And it's why they violate God's law. And it's why the answer is having that old self, that old Adam dead and being freed. And how are we freed? We are freed through him who was crucified, Jesus Christ. And so, so we, can, we are no longer slaves to sin. In Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, it talks about the new man. The old man or woman and the new man or the new woman. And there's a way we lived in our old life and there's a way we're to live in our new life. And how do we do that? Do we just like, hey, I'm just going to try harder? No. You have the power through the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, the resurrection power of Christ is in me. I'm being tempted. I want to overcome that. Even though my flesh would like to indulge in it. Even though the world tells me it's the right thing to do. And even though Satan is trying to encourage me to do that, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can say no. All right? The Bible says that without holiness, no one will see the Lord in Hebrews 12. And as believers, we need to understand that how we live should be a reflection of what we say we believe. And people will often look at your life and see if your life matches up with what you say you believe. And in doing so, they're trying to figure out if you really believe what you say you believe. Because if you just live how you want, they'll go, well, he says he believes that, but his life doesn't really line up with it. Or she says she believes that, but her life really doesn't line up with it. And in this passage, he's saying very clearly that we do not have to live as slaves to sin that you are free, that the pattern of your life needs to reflect Jesus Christ, that your position is that you have been raised with him, and that in doing so, your new relationship with sin is you have the power to say, I, I don't want to give in to that. I don't want to live like that. And, and he says very clearly here, as we move on in verse 8, he says, now if or since we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. And so that's really good truth because he's saying here that as a believer, death no longer is, has master over any of us. All right, we don't need to fear death. Um, I've always wondered what it would have been like to talk to Lazarus who died, and it says in, in, in John that he was dead so long that his sisters were concerned that he would, if they opened the door to the tomb, it would smell. So they thought he was decomposing, right? And when Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth, and I have heard a pastor say, I'm glad he said Lazarus, or else everybody would have come out of the tombs. Lazarus, come forth. He comes out of the tomb. And I've always wondered what it would have been like to talk to him. So, like, you were dead for days. Yeah. Wow. Are you concerned about dying again? Believe it or not, no. I've been there, done that. I'm, I'm good to go, right? And when Christ resurrected, it says in Matthew 27, 55 and 56, those verses, that the tombs were opened and the saints were resurrected, okay? And that's just to illustrate that at the end of time, God will resurrect all who believe 
uh, well, all people, and the, and the believers will be with him, and then the non-believers, of course, will go on to judgment. And he talks about the fact, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So, he's saying here that what we need to do is when we think about all these truths in these first eight verses, we need to realize that we need to live alive to God. That we need to focus on who God is. I have had a very difficult time, I would say, the last two weeks. I'd say it's probably been one of the hardest time for me to focus on the Lord because there's so much information coming about about the election, right? And so it has been a real temptation. And this week I had to just say, um, I'm just picking my Bible up and I'm putting my phone away with all the notifications about what's going on that seems like every notification, I, I probably need to read that one, right? Or I probably need to listen to that. Or pro- and I, I'm putting it away. Because it's like walking on a tightrope, okay? Satan doesn't care if you fall off to sports or politics or to whatever, as long as you get off the beam, as long as you get off the rope. We're alive to God. And as his children, we need to focus on him. We need to spend our time studying the word in prayer and walking with him. And you know, I'm just going to say it, and you can hate me for saying this, but there was this guy who has this pillow thing, my pillow, and he was at the White House, and he talked about quarantining, and he said, it's time for you to get back in the word. I was like, amen, right? Like, if we want to be a better nation, community, church, people, we need to be back in the word of God, right? Studying the word, walking with the Lord. It says, it says here that if Christ died, now he lives to God, even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. How do I consider myself to be dead to the world, the flesh, and the devil? By being alive to God, by knowing I've got the power to choose, I don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. I can actually choose the right thing. And it says in Isaiah, woe to him who says evil is good and good is evil. And that's the twisted world we live in, right? People want, you know, they want gun control, want gun control, want gun control, want gun control. Okay. For every one person who dies with a gun in America, 25 babies are aborted, and they say nothing about abortion. That's so illogical, right? What does God say? Every human being is vital. Every human being is valuable. Let me focus on the Lord. What are we to do this Christmas? Why don't you commit this Christmas to focusing on the birth of Christ? Why don't you commit this Christmas to figuring out what steps God wants us to take to be more like him, knowing you have the power to choose the right and avoid the wrong. And knowing that that the long-term effect of choosing the right is blessing. I heard about this lady, um, uh, it's, it's the mamma in the Hillbilly Elegy book and she was in the hospital recovering and uh, she was just quite a woman and, and she called uh, JD and said, I hate being in here. And she had all kinds of health problems because she lived very unhealthy life. What she ate, all these choices were bad. Smoking, everything was bad. And she said, <laughs> and she's in the hospital and she's like, she calls and says, will somebody please go to Taco Bell and bring me a bean burrito? And I thought, woman, you're in the hospital for health problems and you want Taco Bell, okay? Like, I, let's be logical here. All right, let's be logical here. So I'm just, I'm just thinking through like the long-term effects of making choices that are bad for us. Don't, we don't always get that effect right away, but it's a pattern, right? So our newness of life, we walk, we make those choices. We have the power through the Holy Spirit to make the right choices. We choose the right. The long-term effects you don't see right away either at all. 
and you think, wow, this person, man, they're getting away with, you know, eating horribly, living horribly, all these choices. And this person over here, they're making the right choices and kind of looks like they're behind in the race. And you know what happens? It's like, it's a marathon, okay? It's not a sprint. Life's a marathon. When we, when we say we want to be alive to Christ, no choice for Christ you will ever regret. The long-term effects will be beneficial. No service to the Lord you'll ever regret. No time you spend with the Lord you'll ever regret. No walking in holiness you'll ever regret. You'll never regret the thing you, that you shouldn't have said that you said. You'll never regret doing the thing that you wish you hadn't done. You'll never do that. And so he's saying here in verse 6, I'm sorry, in chapter 6, we're saved by grace and you're free to do the right thing. And in that freedom, you find true freedom. Jesus Christ said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free because he is the truth and he's the one who sets us free. Lord, we are so grateful that we are no longer slaves to fear. We're no longer slaves to sin, but we are slaves to you, Lord, slaves to righteousness. And we come to you and say, as your children, we long to make the right choices, Lord, and to shun the evil. We have the power now through the resurrection of Christ, through the new life you've given us to make the right choices. And although it's not a legalism, we come to you and just say, Lord, work in us by your Holy Spirit the power to live rightly, to reflect you in all we do and say, because that is true freedom. And free us, Lord, this Christmas season that we would focus on the birth of Christ, that through Thanksgiving we would focus on being thankful to you. All we have is from your hand. You're such a good and righteous and holy and faithful and loving God. We love you and exalt you. And Lord, I pray this morning, if somebody's here and they're like, I just, I don't know where I'm at with everything, or if somebody's watching this, that I, I pray that they would come to you and repent of their sins and turn to you. And if they're a believer and they know they're making choices that hurt them, I pray that today they'd say, through your spirit, I have the power to walk in newness of life. That's what I need. That's what I want. Do that work in me. And we ask that you would do that for your glory. And we know that all we will receive from you is blessing as we walk in the light of your goodness. We love you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please stand with us. You are the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a wonderful name.
Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. The silence, the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no Silence the boast of sin and the grave. Oh, wow. Jesus Christ is the King. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, you have brought us in newness of life based on the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, the sacrifice that was made for us. Let us live lives alive to God, knowing that the old person is dead, and let's walk in the newness of life. And let's say, Lord, transform us, help us to choose the right and shun the wrong for your glory. Bless these dear people and all who are driving church and all who watch, Lord, and will watch. We pray you'll bless them in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of your spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you.